Science, where I work with Steve Jackson, who is my co-author on this paper. The paper is called Logistics as Care and Control, an Investigation into the UNICEF Supply Division. In this paper, we cast light on the nature, experience, and ambivalence of global flows that enable HCI work in ICD, ICTD and post-colonial computing settings. To do so, we introduce the concept of logistics to HCI. We define logistics as artful coordination of human and material flows. As one of my interviewees at UNICEF Supply Division said, logistics means that you get goods where they need to be, when they need to be there. Logistics is important to HCI for many practical reasons. As HCI continues to contribute to global technology and infrastructure design, attuning to the powers and limitations of logistics will be key to, to successful technology dissemination. Logistics is the work that happens in the background to make the global reach of contemporary HCI possible. Further, HCI practitioners are often the ones who make logistical IT tools, and therefore they have an ethical stake in the logistical revolution. Though, as I will describe later, there has been a scholarly emphasis on the smooth globalizing effects of logistics, we ask in this paper what happens when logistics moves into particularly difficult places to travel. In the places that the UNICEF Supply Division works, logistics isn't easy and it doesn't always work. We argue that logistics in this case, but perhaps also more broadly, function simultaneously as a form of care and control. To do so, we rely on Foucault's notion of pastoral power. Foucault uh, defines the concept using the figure of the shepherd. A shepherd both looks out for his sheep, caring for them, but also holds them to a certain discipline and has some control over them. This tension between care and control is a tension that we see in logistical work at, at UNICEF. To build out our definition of logistics as work, we rely on past HCI scholarship that theorizes globally dispersed work, namely the concepts of coordination and articulation. Schmidt and Simone define coordination as the varied ways that dispersed workers align individual components of cooperative activities. Starr and Strauss describe articulation work as the often invisible work that gets things back on track in the face of the unexpected. Infrastructure ties these dispersed work processes to the materiality of the built world. This paper builds on prior insights, such as Starr and Ruliter's notion that infrastructures exist as both technical and social, as well as global and local artifacts. Um, it also builds on some of Steve's earlier work, um, which has challenged the notion that infrastructures are always planned, orderly, and mechanical. These classic theoretical concepts apply directly to the contemporary logistics industry, which ties disparate parts of the globe together through intricate coordination work, relying on physical infrastructure and electronic data interchange. Logistics has undergone a revolution in the past 25 years due to gains in technologies of all types, from electronic tools to the standardization of the container. This has rendered transport costs so low that it is often easier to ship something tens of thousands of miles rather than making it regionally. These gains in logistics, however, have raised some troubling questions of organizational power and control. Uh, critical logistics scholars, some of whom I pull out here, um, have particularly emphasized the implications of the logistical revolution on laborers such as dock workers and truck drivers. We agree with this literature and draw on it, yet we see two main limitations to date. The first is that these scholars assume that the world is somehow seamlessly connected. We argue, however, that the term globalization, as anthropologist Anna Singh so beautifully describes, encourages dreams of a world in which everything has become part of one single imperial system, when in fact the systems are still broken up and global connections are fraught with friction. The second main limitation is that the critical logistics scholars have neglected to recognize the care which also makes up a part of logistics. This care component of logistics is particularly salient in the case of logistics at the UNICEF Supply Division. We rely on the definition of care by feminist science schol studies scholars such as Anne-Marie Mole and Maria puig Casa, who explain that care involves a notion of doing and intervening and has strong affective and ethical connotations. Care is a practice that can be done well or badly. We found that the logisticians 
at the supply division care deeply for the beneficiaries that are supposed to be receiving the goods, and this care makes up an essential part of the work that they do. So now for the fun part, this is the case. Um, this study is based on field work at the UNICEF Supply Division. UNICEF is part of the UN, um, and it provides long-term humanitarian and developmental assistance to children and mothers, um, and has an extensive network of around 50 global field offices. The Supply Division, which is a specific branch of UNICEF, serves as a distributing agency for items ranging from vaccines and antiretroviral medications to nutritional supplements and educational supplies. And it works both in international development contexts as well as in emergency situations. This is a huge organization. The supplies made up 10,000 shipments in 2014, and they were valued at $3.4 billion. Um, and this has grown enormously as well. Um, it, it was only, the, the goods were only worth $500 million in 2000. The supply division prides itself on getting goods to the most unreachable in the most trying of circumstances. I began this uh, project in the spring of 2015 with an engagement with the UNICEF Supply Division in New York City, um, and then followed up with some interviews remotely with Copenhagen staff uh, in the headquarters. Um, I then uh, traveled to Copenhagen in the summer of 2015, where I conducted observational, uh, an observational study as well as um, many more in-person interviews. I was also able there to review both public and internal documentation. So I found through this study that whilst supply staff admire and hope to emulate the rigor, integration, and control brought to log logistics in the private sector, they also note their difference with such organizations, marked by the organization's core humanitarian mandate and the particularly challenging context the organization is required to engage. UNICEF differentiates itself from private sector logistics companies because they go to places that these companies simply will not go. Highlighting the challenging nature of their work, a UNICEF employee told me that there are seemingly limitless ways that they can fail. These failures include stock out, heat or cold damage, demurrage, expiration, breakage, wrong documentation, or any kind of delay. These failures have real stakes. A stock out of a, vac of a vaccine means that kids aren't getting vaccinated and they might not return when the vaccines are back in stock. So many people in the organization have started to point to hopes in new IT, tool, to new IT tools to, to help manage some of these issues. Um, they have dozens of different projects going on at headquarters around IT, um, but I will spend a couple minutes just briefly talking about two of the most important IT, tool, IT projects happening. First, the team has recently rolled out a large new enterprise resource planning tool in order to give headquarters more oversight into regional operations and to make data sharing easier. The team chose SAP and rolled it out in a big bang approach in January 2012 to all of the field offices. However, they have found it extremely difficult to roll it out to all the varied contexts in which they work. As one interviewee explained, from a usability perspective, it is the worst ever nightmare you can imagine. The learning curve is not steep, it is vertical. You take weeks and weeks to master just basic things. We here in our context in Europe, people are familiar with computers, they use them at home. But imagine in the middle of a third world country, in an emergency, you come in as a newly hired warehouse manager by UNICEF and they put you in front of that. Either you go mad or you don't use it. The two main challenges they faced in summary were that there wasn't quite enough training at the beginning uh, and also there, were some, there was some lack of enthusiasm from country offices. Um, there's a flip side though and some of my interviews ex interviewees explained that some country offices liked the additional help and oversight that headquarters brought um, and they do say that it's improving um, with time. So the second IT initiative that I briefly want to describe is the supply division's attempts to track goods outside of UNICEF hands to make sure that they get to the beneficiaries themselves rather than being sold in the black market, getting lost, or otherwise getting to the wrong people. Um, distribution patterns for UNICEF vary depending on the specific country context. Frequently, though, UNICEF control ends at the in-country warehouse level, at which point they give goods to partners like Save the Children or, uh, or MSF to distribute to the final beneficiary. So the IT team uh, recently developed a mobile phone and tablet application, which allows final leg distributing partners to report who exactly received goods to the individual level. This was being developed at the time of my research and was being piloted in Nepal, um, which had recently been struck by an earthquake in April 2015. Though UNICEF employees were very excited about the possibilities of control that this tool provides, 
they also noted some important barriers to the project. First, the partner might choose not to use the application or may not be able to use it because of illiteracy, access to device, um, or lack of training. Second, the partner might input false information for a whole variety of reasons. Um, it could be just a simple mistake or it could be for malfeasance like theft or resale. And finally, the partners have reported that um, this additional over oversight sometimes feels like policing rather than celebrating the successes as, as the team initially hoped. So I'd, I'd now like to return to the notion of care that I began with uh, to complement these stories of logistics at UNICEF as trying to get greater control over goods movement. The employees at UNICEF that I spoke with consistently referred to their humanitarian mandate and tied their motivations to this mandate. Many of them found strategies to directly tie their work in Copenhagen to the beneficiaries they cared so much about. So one strategy that they, they used to do this was to compare their large-scale logistics to logistics at a personal scale. For example, one employee told me, we are trying to do things at crazy times, experiment with crazy things. You can recognize it with the carriers, you can recognize it with the freight forwarders. It is not something that they do because they can publish or because they get compensation, but it is an expectation of the work. In transport, when it, when it is goods that save lives, it is like trying to get someone who is really in need to, to get to the hospital. You know, it is that urge that someone feels like doing something. This is one thing the computer does not understand. Comparing large-scale logistics to rushing somebody to the hospital is a very good example of ways that supply division employees describe their work as a form of care. Another strategy, which I can't get into too much today, but is in the paper, is that employees also often drew on past experiences working in country offices to more concretely have individuals in mind while completing their work in headquarters. So at this point, I just want to briefly conclude now with a few final thoughts about these concepts and this case. I argued that UNICEF supplies work represents both a form of care and control, and this tension between these two qualities defines the logistics done at UNICEF supply. I now want to point out that there are, of course, some complications to performing care at a distance. When you're far away, it is often more difficult to engage with beneficiaries, and therefore they're given less choice in, in what kind of care they're receiving. Um, though there are many examples of caregivers who have more de decision-making capacity than rece receivers of care, such as doctors or nurses or educators, um, this care at a distance does have a particular risk of being misguided or, or even harmful. I also want to point again to the difficulty and complexity of logistics in the context that UNICEF works in. In traditional private sector logistics, the term intermodal has gained traction as a way to understand the seamlessness of logistics. With the rise of the container, goods can now move from airplanes to trucks to boats without changing the container shape. Yet, we think that the sites where the transport modes meet such as in this image, which is a picture of Sihanoukville in Cambodia, um, which is where the, I do the bulk of my field work, um, we can also see the meeting of language, regulatory, and cultural modes. I argue, then, that these sites are therefore important places to observe the global frictions inherent to all kinds of logistics. Thank you. Questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Melanie Feinberg. I'm at the School of um, Information and Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the relationships between control and care. Mm -hmm. um, and I think partly when you alluded to sometimes our good intentions can lead to the most harm, mm -hmm. um, what you might have seen in the relations between control and care in that context. I think that um, I think that it, it brings out the trade-offs for any kind of decision. So I think that um, we can, as with I think like the very um, this this pastoral power from Foucault, I think we can see this kind of tension, the care and control, in many kinds of governance. 
So um, even like any kind of welfare state often has this tension between care and control where um, people are doing their best to help, but sometimes um, the end result isn't what you expect. So I think it just makes us think a little bit more carefully about um, when we're building out um, systems like this. Um, so for example, in the IT systems, um, I think that they are, um, I think that everybody wants them to do the best that they can do, but sometimes they don't think about the, the privacy autonomy trade-offs. Um, uh, so I think that it's a way to kind of keep both of those things at the forefront. I hope that answers the question. You mentioned very briefly uh, the paternalism that happens where you've got the people in Copenhagen uh, emotionally responsible for what's happening locally. Could you say a little more about that? And the reason I mention it is it seems to have such relevance for the global teams that some of us find ourselves managing today. Could you... So your question is, how are... The paternalism, you just touched on it. What, yeah. Could you say a little bit more about it and if that's a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I think that it's... I, I think that we can look at it as paternalism. Um, I think we can also look at it as a form of... Um, I mean, it's... A, it's it's inherent to any of these global co global collaborations, but I think that there are the power dynamics that we really need to be aware of, especially when we're looking at these, you know, large international organizations. Okay, let's uh, thank Maggie once again. Thank you.